We call this atmospheric blurring. Sometimes it's called atmospheric sea. That's kind of the observational term. For at the observatory, we might ask, what's the scene tonight? That's the amount of blurring. Is it one arc second? Is it two arc seconds? Let me give you a typical range, and then I'll explain the process. A typical scene, or atmospheric blurring, is about one arc second. Again, it's much, much bigger than this number that we just computed somewhere back here, 0.025 arc seconds. So this is a very significant effect. Now, at a great sight, on a great night, where the conditions are just perfect, it can get down to like 0.2 to 0.3 arc seconds, but still nowhere close to the diffraction limit of the telescope. At Chapel Hill, we have our campus telescope. Chapel Hill is typically maybe two arc seconds to sometimes 10 arc seconds. Sometimes it's really crappy here. Now, this is not a place where you put telescopes for real scientific use. Our campus telescope is more for education and public outreach for this reason primarily. Also, the bright skies. So let's explain the process of atmospheric blurring. Here we see light rays coming down from space. They're coming in parallel lines because the star is really far away. You can see that in the image. But as they get into Earth's atmosphere, they get a little wobbly. And they become more and more wobbly the farther they go. And that's because the atmosphere is not nothing. It's not traveling through space anymore. It's a substance. There's density there. It's kind of like passing through very low density glass. And what does glass do to light as it goes through it? It, what's the term? Refracts it, that's right. Bends the light, often one direction or another direction. As you go from a medium of one density to a medium of another density, you get a deflection. So, the atmosphere, it's not like a well-made prism or a low-density prism. It is a messy thing, and it's always moving around and always changing. It tends to break into what we call cells atmospheric cells or atmospheric pockets where each pocket will be slightly lower density or slightly higher density you know, all the way down from space all the way down here to the ground and you have temperature differences as well suppose this one's a little bit hot not extremely hot just maybe a fraction of a degree hotter well hot gas does what expand or contract expand so this cell is going to expand a little bit so its density is going to be lower. This cell might be a little bit colder, so it contracts. So that means its density is going to be a little bit greater. So I change the density of the atmosphere. Even these little amounts, as the light goes down, it's going to refract. You change the density, you change the index of refraction. So it's going to refract one way, and then another way, and then another way. And these deflections are going to build up as you go down. So it's coming in straight, but this will bounce it that way, and then this way, and then it can end up going all over the place by the time it eventually gets down to your telescope. Now, if the atmosphere would just stay put, if it was fixed and all these pockets were fixed, light would come down to end up in a different place. Just a little bit. This star is supposed to be here and it's over there. This star is supposed to be here and it's over there. Just small amounts. But it would be fixed. Of course, the atmosphere is not fixed. It's changing. These cells are moving. This might be moving this way. This might be moving up. They might be merging. Their temperatures are changing. They're expanding, contracting. And there's so many of these cells that when you add it all up and add all the changes, it's like we're looking through a, I mean, the atmosphere is like looking through a whole bunch of, sorry, I'm off the edge there, a whole bunch of low power lenses. But they're always changing, and all these little changes add up on the time scale of a hundredth of a second. It's like we're looking through a whole bunch of different low power lenses. Very rapid time scale. The atmosphere changes, at least the positions and blurrings of stars on the time scale, of about one one hundredth of a second. In addition to moving the star around, the apparent position of the star around in the sky, lenses can magnify and demagnify. So as the star is coming down through all these different pockets, it gets magnified and unmagnified and magnified and unmagnified. And you've seen this before. You've seen the stars twinkle. That's the atmosphere changing underneath it, magnifying and demagnifying the light over and over and over. Now, here's an interesting aside. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but planets don't twinkle, stars do. And the reason why is planets, although to your eye, you can't tell a difference 
in terms of size, uh, the planets are indeed bigger. If you look through a telescope, a planet's extended, a star is just a point. The atmospheric cells are maybe this big. So let's draw some atmospheric cells, draw some over this planet as well. There might be a whole bunch of atmospheric cells covering the planet. The star being small, I mean it's a big object, but so far away from an angle point of view, it's smaller than the atmospheric cell. So it's at the mercy of this atmospheric cell. It can be magnified, it can be demagnified. As different cells move in, or as the cells change all the way up the atmosphere, it will twinkle. But the planets, maybe this one is magnified, this one's demagnified. It's kind of random from cell to cell. So in the planets, since there's so many cells covering, on average, half of them are magnifications and half of them are demagnifications, so it averages out. You can't see that this is bigger with the human eye because you're using this little telescope, your eye, with poor angular resolution. The stars, the planets seem just as big to the naked eye. But you look up at the stars and see them all twinkling, but one of them is not. That's actually a planet. That's one way to tell. Okay. Tangent there, but it's kind of a nifty tangent. Anyway, that was an aside. So what's going on here? Suppose we're looking at a star. And suppose it's a bright star. Now if it's a faint star, we have to open the shutter of the camera, sometimes for minutes, sometimes for hours, just to see it. Suppose it's so bright of a star that we can see it in a hundredth of a second, easily. Then what we can do is we can put a video camera on the back of the telescope and watch the star bounce around. So here's the star. And suppose the black circle is the diffraction limit of the telescope. The amount of blurring you naturally get from the telescope. In a hundredth of a second, it'll be over here, and then over here, and over here. And you get magnifications and demagnifications at each of these points. It's bouncing all over the place. And you can actually see that in video if it's sufficiently bright and you can detect it in a hundredth of a second. For most things we're interested in, we can't see in a hundredth of a second. So we have to open our shutter for a long period of time, and during that period of time, it bounces around in that blue disk. And again, depending upon atmospheric conditions, that disk is typically one arc second across. You know, great night at a great site, it can be smaller, not so great site, it can be bigger. Um, again, on a not so great night, it can be bigger. But that's the typical size of the atmospheric distortion area. It's the size of the cells. And so it gets uh, blurred out over that scale. So if you try to look at something faint like a galaxy, suppose here's the galaxy and there's all sorts of detailed structure. But a hundredth of a second later, it's going to be moved. And a hundredth of a second after that, it's moved again, and then again. And you can see, if we add up all these moves, it gets blurred out. And so after the one hour integration that might be necessary, or even the one minute integration that might be necessary to see it, it gets blurred and all the detailed structure might be lost. So there are ways to combat that. One way is to go to a different wavelength. I said the atmosphere is like a whole bunch of lenses, and lenses are like composites of prisms, as we saw. Well, here's light going through a prism. And as you can see, the redder colors are refracted less. The blue colors are refracted more, or scattered by the material of the glass molecules more. So one way that you can combat this is to observe in redder light. The bluer the light, the greater the amount of scatter. The redder the light, the straighter down it comes. So as we go towards the red and eventually into the infrared, we get less and less atmospheric distortion. If we go to the radio, we don't get any atmospheric distortion. It goes through as if there's no atmosphere at all. So that's one way you can do it, but sometimes the science you're doing requires observing in the blue, or the ultraviolet, where it's even worse. So, what can you do? Well, we'll get back to that, but while I'm on this, I want to have a diversion and talk about why the sky is blue. Right? This is at that point in your college career where you find out why the sky is blue. Here's red light and blue light coming down from the sun. The red light has bounced around a little bit, but more so than the blue, it comes straight down to you. The blue, each scatter is greater, each refractive deflection is greater, and so it ends up all over the place. And so light coming down here can be scattered into our, let's say we're standing here, we have blue light from this direction that's scattered in, blue light from this direction that's scattered in, this direction, that direction. Every direction we look, there's blue light being scattered from that area because it scatters more easily to our eye. 
And we'll see, see this astronomically as well. Shorter wavelengths scatter more easily than longer wavelengths. So that's why the sky is blue. It's just the blue light from other directions being scattered towards you. The red light scatters last, and we see that at sunsets and sunrises. Here's the Earth. Here's the atmosphere. It's paper thin. In fact, I'm exaggerating the thickness of the atmosphere here. If the sun's here, it has to pass through a little bit of atmosphere, and the blue light scatters all over the place, and so no matter where we look, we're seeing the blue. But suppose the sun's over here. It's on our horizon. This is our horizon. If you're standing here, this is the horizon. So the sun's either rising or setting, and that light is going through all this atmosphere. So you have much greater opportunity to scatter out the blue. Instead of scattering out a little bit of blue, you scatter out all the blue. So you look at the sun from this direction, all the blue is gone. Some of the red is gone too, but all the blue is gone, so here you can see it again. Going through a lot of atmosphere, sunrise or sunset, and the sun will look red. The moon will look red. Planets will look red. Stars will look red. Now the planets and stars you might not notice, because they don't have as much light, and so your cones may not trigger. But if it's left to your rods, your rods just see black and white. But if it's a really bright star or a bright planet, as it's rising, take Jupiter. If you know when Jupiter's going to rise, go out and look at it. If it's clear, it will look really red until it gets a certain distance off the horizon. That's the atmosphere scattering out all the blue light. So now you know why the sky is blue and why sunsets and sunrises are red.